Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me tonight are... Joe. And Devin. Welcome back, Devin. Thank you. This is like your third time back, right? Yes, it is. Man, he's been on the show more than Chris lately. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing Chris doesn't listen to the episodes. <laughs> Well, uh, what are you guys drinking tonight, Joe? Uh, I am drinking A Wizard is Never Late by Triptych. Nice. Devin. And I am drinking uh, Dragon's Milk, bourbon barrel-aged stout. Ooh. Devin's not screwing around tonight. Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. I am drinking a Tanner's Orchard tea uh, called Perfectly Peach, a Rui Boss tea. Which has Brewery Boss tea, marigold flowers, and some natural flavoring. It's really good. What's the alcohol content on that, Aaron? <laughs> Zero. Okay. Trying well, to take a small break from alcohol for a bit. There's nothing wrong with that. At least you'll be consistent on the episode tonight. Right. Let's hope. Keep me in line. All right. Let's see. So for news... Bit of a sad topic, but uh, Grant Thompson, owner of the King of Random channel, uh, died in a parasailing accident this week. Do you guys have anything you want to say about that? Yeah, um, I, I don't know about your guys' space, but I mean, we have uh, so many projects that have come from the things that we've seen on his channels, uh, little carbon electrode welders, uh, electric foundry a propane foundry uh a lot of the cool projects that he did have you know found their way into our space um and a lot of people in our shop have started doing things they never thought just because of the way that he you know portrayed them of like hey this is 12 dollars in two hours of your time but just being able to communicate that effectively to people and showing people that it's not you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to get these things done yeah right yeah, he actually inspired me to make a couple things. Um, I really enjoyed his video on the uh, recycled plastic bottle thread. Oh, oh nice. That yeah. was really neat. From that, I actually went on a whole thing of trying out different ways of using plastic bottle thread um, for like recycled plastic thread, like hanging gardens. So essentially stripping down the two liter bottle to thread, but leaving like the last quarter of the bottle. So like where the, the mouth is hanging upside down, punching some holes in it, printing a small coupler that's, that screws onto the lid, and then just hanging another bottle from that. Then, then as you pour water on the top, it would just trickle down like a funnel through each plant. Oh, nice. But, I mean, that, that was all based off of his you know, initial video. Hmm, that's neat. As another update from last week's news topic of Adrian Boyer's 3D printing proposal, he posted a very technical update on his on what he came up with uh he actually coded up uh, a computer simulation of how the electricity will flow through the monomer and how it will react and a lot of it most of it went over my head (laughs) (laughs) consensus seems to be that it might work yeah a lot of it flew straight over my head too it was very deep technical article looking forward to talking to him about it at earth though yeah It'd be perfect time to talk to him about it. Yeah. Are you coming to Earth, Devin? When is it? October 12th and 13th. I should be available because it's right after our grand reopening extravaganza. So we, I, yeah, I think things will be a little busy after that, but I should be able to sneak away for a weekend. You should totally come to Earth. You can hang out in our booth with us. Nice. I need to get away from the space more as much as I enjoy spending all my waking non-working hours at the space uh i I should Ah. i should get away a little bit more it's a good thing i'm occasionally finding out that people outside of the makerspace culture hang out together and are friends oh that's and um i know right (laughs) um yeah i i I don't even know what to do it's I, i get around them i'm like wait so you you don't you don't do these Oh, what do we talk about? Okay. <laughs> you don't spend all your spare money on bandsaws and CNC equipment? 
<laughs> How many bandsaws are you up to? I feel like you've bought one every day since we've talked. About <laughs> uh, so I have purchased only one bandsaw since the last time I was on. And I have sold four of them. But the one that I bought was a 1967 Delta Rockwell metal cutting bandsaw with the wow. riser kit and this really slick custom extended table. Uh, and the guy was very wonderful when he built it because the extended table just lays on top of the old table and screws into the um, rails that a fence would go to. So it didn't oh, like nice. he didn't molest the table. He didn't remove the table. So it's still a very complete, very nice vintage machine that is it has everything original on it and it's in beautiful condition, even like the electrical cord is original and not dry rotted and cracked. So that's nice. awesome. So now we have yet another metal cutting bandsaw in the shop. So that reminds me of that song from Rent, where it's like, how do you measure a year? Oh my God. And like <laughs> love or cups of coffee. Do you measure it in bandsaws? <laughs> so Joe Leonard is, last time we, he was just ever at our space like two weeks ago. He was passing through and he just said, hey, you mind if I stop by? And by stop by, it was, you know, stay for 28 hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's doing in our space this week. Yeah. And uh, he was like, because we I was moving around some bandsaws and he's like, man, you got a lot of bandsaws. Because we should call you Dr. Bandsaw. <laughs> so now they might be giants. Dr. Worm plays in my head every time I talk to Joel. Uh, so he's trying to, <laughs> he's talking about making some shirts up to say Dr. Bansaw, and I'm petrified and excited at the same time. I think that's the right emotion. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, it, since the last time we talked, I've also bought uh, a CNC mill. I bought another small tabletop CNC mill. It's an Intellitech. Uh, it's the, the ProLite. I forget what model number it is. It's the same chassis that my Benchman uh, 4000 has it just doesn't have a full enclosure and a tool changer so it's just like the bare bones model um but this one i purchased working so ooh, yeah um moving on up yeah what's that guy, like uh i don't know because it's sitting on a skid right now in the corner of the shop since we just finished moving a couple weeks ago and then we're slowly unpacking all of devin's tools because there's just so much there's so much stuff yeah. Like we we upgraded to almost triple our size, but then everything's on the floor on skids. So it just it's like almost impassable right now. And then I decided to go pick up some more equipment because there was a couple gaps here and there. Yeah. And our last news topic, it's an instructables on a inline uninterrupted power supply for your Raspberry Pi 4. It is made out of a couple of supercapacitors, and it just looks, it's a really neat project. It's, it looks like a very simple build. Like, he just electrical tapes all the capacitors together once they were soldered, and it's all just in line with the power cord. Seems very safe. <laughs> I want to see the failure mode yeah. of that. Yeah, he did say you have to be real careful about the polarity of the, the caps, because there's also an LED in there to tell you when it's on. It's super simple, and because uh, the guy who made this, he has a lot of mains power issues. Well, actually, I think he's on battery power. He's in a trailer. So he has a lot of, uh, when a motor turns on, he gets a big voltage drop. Oh. And that's been resetting his pies. Okay. So this fixes that. So is it is it truly a power supply, or is it more of a cap-based buffer, like a line filter? It's definitely more like a buffer. Okay, okay. But it's like a really high-capacity buffer. Yeah. Yeah. That three super caps in line. I can see this being very useful for something like Octoprint. Yep. Because I'm living in rural power. You know, we get brownouts all the time. You know, somebody sneezes and the, the power flickers. So a brownout when you're running off of a somewhat sketchy USB brick already and you're already getting the not quite enough voltage warning in Octopi, brownout totally restarts the Pi. <laughs> So actually, this could be kind of useful for me. <laughs> you don't have a um, like a uh, battery backup computer. I forget what they're called. You know what they're called? A UPS. An there we go. Uninterrupted power supply. 
There we go. I have Dra- one sitting <laughs> on my bench. I was about to say Dragon oh. Milks knows what it is, but I don't. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dragon Milk knows the universe. Um, mm. Yeah, I uh, I totally have a UPS. It's sitting on my bench and hasn't been installed anywhere yet. I'll get around to it one of these days. Probably right after I lose a 40-hour print at hour 38. Luckily, that didn't happen when I just finished Chief 40-hour prints this week. <laughs> oh, those last couple hours on both of those, I was so puckered. It's like, just finish. Just finish. <laughs> I don't have enough filament to finish one other one. <laughs> so, Joe, do you have any project updates this week? I do. Man, this week's been so fun. Uh, so... The biggest thing that I did this week that I'm excited about is I finally uh, got off my butt and tried um, soluble supports on the tool changer. And they worked so good that I'd never want to use real support material again. Um, (laughs) I I used uh, uh, 3D Fuels Hydro Fuel or Hydro V. I had the card sitting here and now I don't. Anyway, I had a sample from Murph and uh, that stuff worked great and I didn't dry it out. So I'm shocked that it worked as good as it did because usually um, water soluble filaments, they just soak up any moisture that comes out of the air. And this stuff was even kind of tacky when I pulled it out of the uh, bag just from the moisture on my skin. But It ran fine. I've ran multiple parts with it now. And uh, I've tried a couple of different methods. So I ran one where my support material was all the Hydro V. And um, that one finished out. It turned out great. And um, I just soaked it in warm water overnight. I didn't even agitate it. And I pulled it out the next morning. Or this morning, I guess. And... um, it was completely dissolved, and I just had my part. I uh, I was printing it next to um, inland PETG, so just garbage PETG, and it stuck really well. And then the other method I tried was using PETG for my support material and just using the Hydro-V for the interface layers. And I, I don't feel like that came out as good. I haven't soaked it yet, but all of the... Uh, support material is still stuck to my part. Um, and it, I feel like instead of doing a really good job of just being support material, it just kind of oozed into my actual material and didn't do its job as support material. So I don't feel like that was a good function. But um, I used Pathio to generate the soluble supports, and that worked out really well. Um, yeah, that's my biggest project update right now is soluble supports on the tool changer work well. Awesome. Devin, you work on anything this week? Um, other than unpacking 55 skids of tools and equipment, um, I, I, I purchased another stupid thing cause our, uh, from our space to the freight elevator is like 10 feet. But then once you hit the bottom of the freight elevator, it's like, 1500 feet to the parking lot. So I bought a Cushman Titan 4000. So if you guys aren't familiar with them and you've ever watched sports ball uh, and someone gets hurt and they have to cart them off the field, it's the same flatbed truck they use. Uh, And if you've ever seen, um, oh, what's that one movie? Everyone always makes, oh, the Austin Powers movies when he gets stuck in the hallway bumping back yes. and forth and then yeah it's that exact ah, cart yeah, yeah. and <laughs> so the guy bought it at auction and it was all sorts of trashed chassis is beautiful brakes work rear differential it's got a four horsepower 48 volt motor um the batteries are toast there was some questionable electronic modifications um so i'm just basically uh i just put four new tires and rims on it because they decided to fill all of the old tires with liquid rubber for some reason. <laughs> and uh, 
they the tire shop couldn't get them off the rim, so I'll I'll cut those off and have some spare rims down the road. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got We're building a new deck for it, so the we're derating it because the capacity on it right now is four thousand pounds, but we put uh, trailer tires on it, so it'll haul about two thousand pounds in the bed. And we're putting uh, stake pockets on the sides, so members will be able to, you know, leave the sides on it and load the thing up with 2,000 pounds of lumber or band sauce and drag it into the space. <laughs> so, nice. yeah. It's a lot it's, of band sauce. It, depending on the size of the band saw. Um, yeah, or one. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's been keeping a lot of my time because it just... We don't have the room in our space, so I have it hiding in the basement of our giant facility in the corner and hoping no one messes with it and just working on it as I can. But that's it. Nice. I have a couple of things I was working on this week. I spent a lot of time uh, designing a new front panel for the PrinterBot Simple Pro Kit. I bought the GLCD RepRap display. Um, I also bought a Duet Maestro controller for it. Which is way bigger than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's the exact same uh, footprint as the Wi-Fi. I was thinking the Maestro was the same size as like a ramps board. I actually had no idea how big it was going to be. Um, when I was looking online for a, a 3D model for it, so I could throw it in Fusion and kind of test out the size from there. There's no models for it yet that are released. But the Duet forum guys said that it's the same footprint as the Wi-Fi as far as hole spacing. So I was like, oh. So I guess if you really want to do a test fit you could just download the wi-fi model yeah but i have the actual thing here now and there's only about like two or three millimeters of clearance on the sides for it so it just barely fits yeah so i got that glcd riprap display for it because the maestro has support for that because i i was really going to make this like a super beefy build but now i'm just wanting to make it more of a budget fun hobby build make it nice and portable and fun so i can take it to events because I don't really like hauling my i3 around. Uh, so I didn't want to spend the money on a panel due for it. So I was really happy that it had the GLCD support. But the existing uh, display mount for it doesn't fit, of course. So I had to design a new one. And with that display, it has an SD card reader that you can actually use to print directly off of the display as well. So I want to be able to access the SD card. So I spent, you know, probably several hours, probably close to 12 hours this week across like a couple days designing and and iterating over revisions of a front panel for it. And this morning, I think I finished it. I still need to print it and verify everything fits. But I've incorporated standoffs for the display, just because the way that display is, like, the actual PCB is a good, I think it was 5.75 millimeters away. Like, the the, the holes are 5.75 millimeters away from, like, the top of where the screen actually goes. Mm Mm-hmm. Then there's like two sandwiches of PCB, so I made a spacer for that as well. Then I actually used Fusion's uh, loft and shell features for the first time. That was really fun. Um, made those two separate bodies. So now the SD card has a nice like guide. So like you can't like miss with the SD card. It just kind of guides you and funnels you down to the SD card slot. So that's really, really fun. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Then I also added a little flexible portion so we can hit the reset button or the stop button on the GLCD display because I forgot that was there and then put it in before. I don't think I've ever used that button though. Like ever. Yeah. But what if I wanted to use it and I didn't have a thing there? Like once this build is done, I'm not going to want to come back to it. You say that. (laughs) (laughs) What else? Oh yeah. I I bought a, uh, a dehydrator this week. And immediately chopped it up to use as a filament dryer. So that's been pretty neat. If you follow me on Twitter, uh, I was posting stuff about that. Also, I was asking people about how they store and organize their filament. Because I'm starting to do that now and want to see what other people are doing. So if you have some, if you have an interesting way to that you organize your filament, email us or uh, reach out to me at, at Aaron Makes on Twitter. Because I'm curious to see what you guys are doing. Did you get any good responses or did you get a bunch of people like me that's like, well, there's a pile over here and a pile over there and some tubs over there that have a lot of filament in them. I got a lot of good responses, actually. Really? 
a lot of people have a, there's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, you know, some people do the rep, the rep boxes. Someone, uh, Geoff does just some shelving in his closet, but they're all organized by type. And then the important stuff, I think he puts in bags. Um, someone, she puts filament in their own bags with their own desiccant, adds a label as to when the filament was bought and when the desiccant was added and like keeps track of that and actually weighs it out each time and writes down the new weight or something like that. Damn. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> yeah. I got a lot, I got a lot of great responses. Somebody is far more organized than me. Yeah. And then she actually uh, prints from a super dry box. So she has like an individual filament spool size dry box that has like hardcore desiccant in it. And then it prints and it goes directly from that to the printer. So whatever she's currently using stays dry. That's how I print nylon. But everything else, I've got rolls of PLA that have been out for like five years. <laughs> Chuck them on the printer and hit go. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I just have bins and bins filled with literally pounds of desiccant because I'm a maniac and I buy lots of desiccant. Yeah. Yeah. Having you rechargeable guys, desiccant is really nice. Do you guys need desiccant? Yeah. Just question. D yes. How much? Probably, yeah. How, how many pounds? Ten. Done. <laughs> I, well, I, I went to buy 30 pounds and our local industrial supplier said, oh, well, anything in aisle one is 70% off today. So I bought nice five skids of desiccant. <laughs> <laughs> it ended up being about 15 drums. Each drum is 300 pounds or 150 pounds of desiccant. So uh, damn, son. I, I had a you feeling... Couldn't... You were going to say 30 turned into 300 somehow. No, it, it, it's the it. I forget what the math out is, but it's it was like over 1200 pounds of desiccant. And I sell it on eBay and it sells really well. But I mean, if I'm going to Earth, I'll just bring like a drum. Sweet. <laughs> you couldn't have asked me yesterday. I actually just bought uh, a pack of rechargeable desiccant. They can actually plug into the wall oh. and it will heat it up and dry it out. Listen, oh, I have man. some, I have so much. I just throw it away. I just, there's so much of it. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I did my dry boxes is I just had uh, cloth bags and I kept a pound or two pounds in them. And I, the, what I would throw the spools in the oven, throw the desk in the oven, chuck them back in the dry box. And, you know, I, I kept two kilograms of nylon in the dry box at a time. And I just bake it once a month or so. And as long as it stayed in the dry box, it was good. But yeah. you open that dry box for 10 minutes and the nylon's like, ooh, water. <laughs> huh. So who's going to develop yeah, so the print from dry box with built-in dehumidifying, you know, uh, dehydrator all in one shot to where you just you just buy these individual modules that are really sort of inexpensive. And you just load your material into it. And you just leave it in there forever. And it's got a moisture sensor and an Arduino and yada, yada, yada. The rep box guys aren't far from that. They don't have the dehumidifying yeah. module, but they're monitoring humidity, I'm pretty sure. And they have nice seals and they've got nice, um, they've got like a nice Bowden tube with a sealed port coming out of it. Oh, nice. Like a push I'm to trying connect to get fitting. them to, Yeah. Trying to get him to hook me up with one for the tool changer. Like, come on, man. I'll be a tool changer tester for you. They're like, nah. This just gives us a reason to buy a tool changer. Like, yeah, but I need one. <laughs> <laughs> and one of our guys from the makerspace, he built an enclosure and just bolted a food dehumidifier or um, dehydrator to the back of it. Yeah. And... That works real well. He prints ABS and ASA in that all day with no warps. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. It's just like a $35 dehumidifier or dehydrator from Amazon. Yeah, we used to run some of our printers in a old HMI cabinet, human machine interface cabinet. And we just had like a little 150 watt space heater in there. And it would just run all the time. 
So it was basically another enclosure around the printer that kind of just kept warm enough to keep the filament sort of dry. And that was great, other than it was a pain in the ass anytime you had to do literally anything to that machine. Well, I mean, you could do the same thing with a light bulb in a box. Yeah, yeah. You'd be amazed at how good a couple 75 watt light bulbs in a box would do. Like, that's actually how um, a lot of people keep their filament, is they just have like a clamp lamp into an enclosure of some sort. Just heating up the box. And it just as long as it stays dry, your filament will stay dry. As long as there's heat, it'll stay dry. It's shockingly not hard. You just have to keep good seals. You guys are talking about the main topic? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. I'm trying to avoid it for as long as possible, but yeah. Today's topic is a bit rough, but it is about uh, safety in the makerspace, and how have we handled uh, safety incidents in the past? At River City Labs, we had our first major safety incident about two weeks ago now, and things have kind of settled, so now we're a little bit more comfortable about talking about it, but we brought Devin on because he's also re- had a couple issues with his space with it, so we thought we'd want to talk about it and share that with you guys. I guess to start, we had a member who was by himself at the space and operating the table saw and managed to cut a couple of his fingers real good, um, like down to the bone. Yeah. And had to go to the emergency room and get a ton of uh, sutures and stitches um, to close it up. And one thing that we found out was that we have no idea what to do (laughs) in those situations. Yeah. Uh, I just know Joe called me. Uh, He and I both saw the same. Um, He posted in the Woodshop channel. I was like, we need to get a blade guard ASAP. I just cut myself real bad. And I was like, oh. And Joe called me. He's like, what do we even do? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was um, I, I, it was funny. Josh texted me later and he was like, yep, I've, I have learned that when you call me, it's serious. And I need to answer immediately. <laughs> yeah. Like you rarely ever call me. I, I don't call anybody. I I avoid talking on the phone at all cost, all all costs. And so if I'm calling you, it's for a reason. <laughs> what we ended up doing was, uh, let's see. I I went to the emergency room to kind of stay with him for the entire day until he was discharged. Uh, mostly just because he he didn't have any family in the area, so I kind of helped him out and drove him home and stuff. But then we had a couple other officers and Joe go to the space and help kind of triage the situation and get the space kind of cleaned up so it's not like a health hazard. I kind of made an executive decision to kind of close the wood shop for a week until the next, because we had a members meeting that Thursday. So I just said, let's just close it. I know it's a knee jerk reaction, but let's just close it until we get get our bearings because none of us really know what we're doing right now. Now we're starting to work on it, work out a process as far as if this happens again, you know, here's the steps that we need to do, you know, make sure that maybe make sure the member's okay. Um, you know, how, what, what kind of um, situations the space in, does that person have a waiver signed, you know, who's his, con- where's his contact information? Does he have an, um, a backup contact, stuff like that. We're starting to work through that now, you know, as directors, we're starting to work through that because, you know, we just, we were just like chickens with our heads cut off. We had no idea what to do and we don't want to have to be in that situation again. I think we all thought we knew what we did, what to do. That's where we got into the trouble was we all thought we knew what to do until it happened. And then right. a whole bunch of scenarios went down and it was just like, all right, what do we actually do? And, and that was when you and I kind of jumped in and I went and triaged the space. You went to check on the member. And then, you know, as we were going, I think as we calmed down, quickly settled in that we actually did know what to do. It just took a minute because you know, we've been running for six years without an incident. Yeah. So it took us all by surprise. Yeah. Cause he was a, he's one of the more experienced woodshop members. So he's, he was one of the people that I least expect to have an issue. I don't know, but the, the most experienced people I think are also the ones that are 
probably the most likely to have an issue just purely by statistics sake. You know, they're the ones that are, are doing it the most and, you know, therefore putting themselves at the most risk, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it, in this member's case, it was complacency. He, um, you know, he had been doing that particular cut for a while and he was very comfortable with it. And he, you know, complacency sets in and you don't kind of have your guard up as much as you would necessarily when you start the project or if you were a new member who wasn't comfortable with the tool and you know, you're constantly checking everything you do because you're not so comfortable. Um, I think comfort with tools is, is, is a, almost as much of a hazard as non education with tools. Yeah, that makes sense. Devin, would you be able to talk a little bit about how the Akron space has handled situations like this in the past? Yeah. Um, so we've had several types of, of accidents, so, you know, close calls, uh, where no one gets hurt, equipment might get damaged, but you know, it's, it's just a learning experience. And we've had a couple of those, um, recently we, I say recently in the last year, we've had one member, uh, get hurt. Um, and it was kind of, it was one of those things that you just don't really think about until it happens, like you guys said, but it wasn't on a dangerous piece of equipment. Uh, it was a member that was unfolding a sawhorse, but it was a, a heavy metal sawhorse that had some fixturing bolted to it. So it was a little heavier than normal. And when they were opening it up, their finger got caught in the hinge. And if you've ever opened up a folding metal sawhorse, you'll know the exact point that I'm talking about that when you fold it open, it's basically like a scissor uh, opening and closing, but with eighth inch plate steel. And yeah. it actually cut their finger to the bone and then peeled part of it back. Um, so even though it was like, oh, they just pinched their finger. No, they just cut their finger open to the bone and peeled part of it back. Um, and we had a very similar reaction. Like we've had a lot of close calls at the shop and we've never really had any very serious uh, accidents up until recently with this event. And, you know, some of us were out of town and like I left the event that I was at, you know, an hour away and came back to the space. And some of the members that were there at the shop, I had two board members there at the shop at the time, and they were able to take that member to the hospital to seek medical attention. And basically... My vice president uh, was on his way there anyway, and he went ahead and took care of like cleaning the space, making sure there wasn't a health hazard and getting uh, everyone there to kind of, hey, did you see what happened? We reviewed uh, security cameras we have to evaluate the situation. We talked with the member and then we actually have a, a kiosk that we have an incident report that got filled out. Um so we got to, to stop and take a look at all of those things in the moment, you know, while yeah. this member was with our treasurer at the hospital getting medical attention, we were already on top of it at our space going, okay, what happened? And we actually, um, the board meeting was two weeks from then anyway. So what we did is, okay, let's, uh, you know, what did we learn from this? What can we do to prevent this? Um, we During the board meeting, we show the security cam footage um, and we say, okay, you know, this is what happened. You know, it's same thing, you know, making sure that there's liability forms on, on order, uh, that we have them with people that have filled everything out in our filing cabinets. Um, and then it's just kind of like just trying to see what we can learn from this and how we can prevent this in the future. Uh, and it, it really was an accident. Like there was plenty of people there at the shop and it was just when they were opening up the, the saw horses, they just didn't realize where their fingers were. And then when they folded it open, it just, it just bit them and it bit them hard. And you know, we know now that we don't just assume that everyone knows how to do all the things, you know, we just say, Hey, yeah. when you open up these, there's a pinch point, you know, there is a warning sticker that they print on the side of the sawhorse. Just make sure people understand there's a warning sticker on the side. It's kind of there for a reason. 
Um, you know, we've had, we've had a, a couple other small incidents. We've had issues with, uh, a member threw a piece off a table saw on accident. Um, and it was just making sure that when we, we were running our safety classes from that point forward, making sure that as we're talking about how to use the table saw, that we make sure we instruct, like, as soon as the blade severs, you don't stop. You keep going until your material is no longer trapped between the blade and the fence. And that will prevent, you know, a two foot by two foot piece of MDF from flying across the shop. You know, I even had a small little burn uh, on a, during a welding class. I had a piece of metal fall and hit my hand. Uh, and that's when we realized, oh, we don't have a burn kit. So <laughs> guess what we had the next damn day? A burn kit. Yeah. Uh and it's it's those things that until they happen, you don't really know what you need. Uh unless you have like a full checklist. You can find those online, but it's you know, it's making sure that when those things do happen, you do take the time to evaluate that situation and say, Okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong, and how can we do better? And making sure that the next time that something happens, or even if it's a close call, you still address that situation and you make sure that you handle it. We should get a burn kit. Should get a burn kit. I think we have a burn kit. Get some nice nonstick gauze, the perforated plastic kind. Grab some burn spray, very low lidocaine antiseptic spray. And obviously all of your antibiotic creams. And then instruct people on how to use those things. Because when people get into the situation, they kind of want to panic and you need to make sure you have a couple people that are, you know, your, especially your regulars that they understand how to use all that stuff. You know, we do, uh, usually, uh, bi-yearly fire extinguisher training. Um, we're able to do that because the, we, we were looking for some tools and equipment at a place and they were throwing out all these old fire extinguishers and they're way out of date, but they still have a charge. So we can yeah. take them out in the parking lot and say, okay, here's how you use a fire extinguisher. And then we just have them spray down a, you know, a trash can or something. It's not actually on fire, but you know, we took, we talk about, you know, here's how you do it. And people get the hands-on experience um, because a lot of people think they know how to do these things, but you put a fire extinguisher in someone's hands that's never used one. And then you kind of, okay, you know, let's aim at the base of the fire. Let's sweep back and forth and, and doing that with, with all the things, the, the safety gear, the, you know, the medical gear, all of that, all that stuff. Have you ever thought about doing accident drills in your space? It's like not actually reacting to somebody getting hurt, but reacting to somebody faking getting hurt that not everybody knows that they didn't actually get hurt. Yeah, that's something we talked about, especially we we're talking about a little bit more because they're getting ready to run one of those uh, statewide accident drills locally here soon. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and we're we're talking about like piggybacking off that and like the following week doing one. But right now everything's, you know, pallets and boxes of tools. So it's <laughs> it's kind of difficult to get that set up when there's not a shop that's set up effectively. But yeah, yeah. Um, it's something we talked about, but it's one of those things that, you know, you're a space and you're always short on volunteer time and everyone says, oh, we'll do it and we never get it done. But it's yeah. it's something that's, you know, based on your guys' experience and our experience, um, you know, like we had a small fire at the shop like two years ago. Um, a member was welding in the welding lab and someone for some reason had walked from the lathe, which is on the opposite opposite corner of the shop, with their oily titanium shavings, and walked them past three different metal scrap bins to put them in the scrap bin in the welding shop. So as they were welding, and we have the security cam footage, which is great to have. If you guys don't have cameras in your space, get some cameras in your space. Um, oh, we do. We have. And that was actually the first thing that went in. Good, good. Because some people push back on those things. And it's like, listen, this is for your safety. Um, but we have the video of the our, this one member, she was welding. And you can see the spark from the MIG welder fly over top of her and land in the scrap bin behind her. 
And then you see like six to 10 minutes later, a little bit of smoke coming out of that bin. And then like right in between two welds, she's, she's like inspecting her work. And then poof, you see the, the scrap bin just catch on fire. And she sees it right away and she turns around and she gets some attention to some other people. And the facility manager was there and he just walks up, grabs a fire extinguisher, puts it out. And same thing. We, we filed a report. We, you know, we, we have an internal report, just a Google doc, um, or Google form. And yeah. we reviewed the, the camera footage and we sat down with her and we we're like, okay, what happened? And she's like, I don't know. It just caught on fire. And then we looked at the camera and we showed her and we're like, oh, this is what happened. And then we looked at the camera further back and we saw a member walking back with metal shavings. Uh, luckily the titanium shavings didn't catch on fire. It was just the cutting oil. Oh, wow. So yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is lucky. <laughs> yes yes so a regular abc fire extinguisher was able to take care of it we didn't have to p- pull out the sand buckets because we do have a couple members that work in exotic materials like we have a member that makes rings out of titanium so um we're like oh you're bringing in things that are very flammable we should probably take care of this it was it was great that that worked out but at the same time it was a learning experience and we cut out a piece of the uh it's right next to one of our welding screens. So we cut out a piece of that and it hangs on the wall. And it says, you know, don't catch a shop on fire. And then we replaced all of our no smoking signs with uh, no smoking unless you're on fire signs. Excellent. Excellent. Nice. My favorite safety sign is um, this machine will uh, kill you and it will hurt the entire time. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good reminder of how dangerous the things that we work with really are sometimes. Yeah. Um yeah, so what do you guys what do you guys talk about when you talk about safety with your members? The thing that I really wanted to emphasize after our accident happened is how responsible everybody is for their own safety. The way that accident happened, you know, it could have happened in a lot of different ways, I guess. I don't know. But it, at at the end of the day, Everybody that walks into the space is responsible to check the machine to make sure it's in safe working order, to check their their um, workpiece to make sure that it is safe to work on, doesn't have cracks or whatever that will can cause a, a dangerous situation, and to make sure that as they're operating, they're operating in a safe way. But I feel like sometimes um, people are quick to place the blame on everything else. Like, they have an accident and the machine is not quite right or their workpiece wasn't quite right or they didn't exactly know how to do the do the operation they're quick to place the blame everywhere else and uh, especially in a makerspace environment i feel like the first place to look in a safety situation is yourself you know, whether yeah. you, you don't know exactly what you're doing you should be aware enough to say, Hey, I don't know exactly how to clamp a workpiece in the saw or, you know, how do I set this fence up and be able to have the presence of mind to stop and, you know, ask the question, whether it's to a member that's present in the space or call an officer and say, Hey, I got a question on this. Are you the right person to ask? And, you know, a lot of times we can answer questions over the phone with the machines. Um, or we're at least able to say, like, you know, if you're not comfortable with this, maybe you should hold off and, you know, set up a time to work with them on something deeper. I don't know. What, what's what? What's your thoughts on all that? So we do we do a couple things. You know, uh, first we have maintainers. All right, maintainers are like managers of each department. Uh, we prefer maintainers because that's their job is to maintain the equipment, to maintain that space. Managers, you know, it has its own, you know, viewpoint from it. Um, but we keep those lists on the walls in every department. So even if you're in electronics lab, you can look up and see who's the maintainer in the wood shop. Um, right. We have those in the member handbook. And then they have all maintainers get a email from the, the makerspace URL. Um, and they, if you want to be a maintainer, you're, your phone number needs to be in the member handbook. 
Um, some people aren't okay with that and we understand, but that's, that's the point is if you're a maintainer, you need to be on call. Um, we also have this thing that we, we basically start is when you become a member in our space, you start as a probationary member. You can come into the shop whenever it's open, uh, during regular open hours. Uh, and you need to be there for at least a month and take one class. And what we say is take a safety class. Safety classes are five bucks. All right. We try to make sure that they're super cheap. The cost only covers the materials. We, you know, we're a volunteer base. Um, so no one gets paid to teach the classes and, you know, people can come in and it's affordable and they can learn safety from someone that's taught literally hundreds of people through a safety class. We do a safety class in metalworking, safety class in woodworking. Um, we're looking to expand more safety classes. One thing that we talk about very heavily in the safety classes is what we, we like to call is, you know, where am I at? Where am I going? And how do I get there? So it's basically three steps before you push a button or turn on any piece of equipment. First thing, where am I at? Evaluate your situation. You know, I'm at a saw. I have a piece of wood. You know, have I taken a look at this piece of wood to see if there's any knots that I'll be cutting through that might dislodge? Are there any nails or screws or staples in my piece of lumber I might be cutting through and causing a problem? Uh, is my machine set up correctly for this cut? Where am I going? All right, I'm going to cut through this on 90 degree angle. That's another kind of thing to help you double check to make sure this, the machine is set up correctly. And how do I get there? Walk yourself through the every individual step. Push the safety button. Squeeze the trigger to, to turn on the chop saw. Slowly lower the chop saw through the material. Release the chop saw back up. Let off the triggers. Let it coast to a stop. Um, and we try to emphasize that in all our safety classes and all of our other classes to every single member in the shop. If you don't take a safety class, you can't use the tools. So the safety class in the wood shop goes over everything but the CNC router. The safety class in the metal shop goes everything over but the welders and the plasma cutter and stuff like that. A little bit more advanced tools and equipment. But it goes over like the uh, guillotine shear. It goes over the hole punch. It goes over the grinders. It goes over the belt sanders. Um, it goes over the drill process. So you understand the basic concepts of what most people are going to be using and at the same time getting it, you know, repeated into your head you know, where you're at, where are you going and how do you get there. Um, and then we also talk about uh, situational awareness, understanding that you're in a community workshop and you need to be aware of who is around you, what they're doing and what you are doing because you might have an eight foot two by four and think you're by yourself, and then you flip around and you clock someone in the head. So making sure people understand what's around them, who's around them, and making sure they're not getting too involved in their project, that they either become complacent and they get hurt, they do something because they're in a rush, um, and you know, just making sure that, that they can come in, they can get their job done, they can clean up and then they can be on their way or they can hang out or, or whatever. Um, and we always emphasize, you know, 30% of the job is clean up. Never think that it's any less because it's always 30% of the job. You know, the first oh, yeah. two, thir you know, a third setup, a third action and a third cleanup. Um, because that is a, a clean workstation is going to make a safe workstation. Um, that is what is going to keep people, you know, being able to come into the shop, get to work effectively, but not have to rush. Because when you rush, you make mistakes. We like to tell people slower is faster. If you take your time, you measure your cuts, you make sure the machine's set up correctly, you're going to scrap less material. You're going to, you know, cause less problems. You might, you know, it, it might be Sunday at 7 p.m. and Home Depot closes and you know, half an hour and you mess up your last piece of material. Not only does it cost you time, it costs you money. You know, you will save so much time and money just by taking a quick second, evaluating your situation. Where am I at? Where am I going? How do I get there? Um, we try to ingrain that in every single person in the shop. We've recently got to the point where we're actually retraining 
old members, members that have been here for seven, eight years. And we're like, hey, we just want to make sure everyone's up to, to, you know, par on their training. So we're retraining everyone and it's required. And we had some people that complained about it. And we said, fine, you're not allowed to use the tools and equipment anymore. Guess what? They went and took the retraining. And retraining is always free at our shop. We don't charge for retraining um, because we don't want to put a barrier if someone is not confident in a piece of equipment, if they're a little cautious around a piece of equipment. We want them to be able to jump back right into another safety class and be like, hey, I know I took one like six months ago, but it's I've been out of the shop for a while and I'm not really comfortable doing this on my own. Um and I, I just want people to be able to come back into the shop and work at their own pace. Uh, and then another thing we like to teach people is have a fearful respect of the equipment. Don't be afraid of the equipment, but have a fearful respect. Understand how the equipment works, how it will hurt you, so you know how not to do the things that's going to cause problems. Like when you're running a table saw, don't let parts sit idle between the fence and the blade. That's just going to cause you issues. Um, you know, un, you know, making sure people understand, you know, the mechanics of what's going on. I don't tear apart a piece of equipment and show them, you know, how a bandsaw works, but I tell them, okay, here's the things you have to watch out for. And we have this, you know, if something is wrong, say something. If a if a if a machine does doesn't feel right, you know, say something immediately. You know, the facility manager is on call. I'm on call. A couple other people are on call. Like if a blade is starting to dull, let us know immediately. We'll get a change. We keep inventory on almost every single consumable in the shop. You know, it's not very um, expensive in the grand scheme of things to keep like a couple extra saw blades for a couple different pieces of equipment. Just because it's like, hey, you know, we understand the 10-inch chop saw, the 10-inch table saw, and the 14-inch band saw get used a ton. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to keep extra blades. And that might be 60 bucks for all of those blades. You know, we don't put ultra high quality uh, blades on stuff. So we understand we're going to be changing them every once in a while. Um, and we like to make sure when we do a training class, we always do training classes on fresh consumables. So everyone understands what a fresh consumable feels like. So when mm. they start on the equipment, they go, huh, this isn't what I remember. And they can immediately reach out to us and be like, hey, something's wrong. It sounds weird. It feels weird. It smells weird. It's burning my wood. What's going on? Um, and then we can immediately address the situation. And sometimes it's user error. And we can immediately retrain on the spot. We can say, hey... You know, what you're doing here is you're using the bandsaw and you're doing too tight of turns and the side of the blade is rubbing. All right. This is a half inch wide blade. You need to make sure you're doing no less than a four inch radius. Uh, any less and you're just rubbing the side of the blade. Um, you know, and, and taking the time with the members to make sure they are comfortable and understanding that people do get complacent if they get too comfortable. So making sure you remind them, hey, this is how this machine will bite you. And it does not care about you. It does not respect you. And it actively wants to hurt you. So just make sure that as you're using it, you respect it and you work within its means and you work within your own means. How do you fight complacency in your shop? Like, it's such a... It, you and I both come from machine shop backgrounds too. It, complacency is such a hard thing to fight because you don't realize you're being complacent until like something scares you out of it. So... We will have, it's be kind, of, kind of known as a Devon talk in the shop. It's where I get a member and I was like, all right, hey, let's take a break from what you're working on and let's sit down and we'll talk. And we kind of have, we try to have a sobering talk. I don't want to show, you know, safety videos that I've seen at work where like people get hurt and or killed. I don't like showing those things in the shop because that tends to push more people away but we'll have a serious conversation and be like, listen, if you're not willing to have this conversation, you are not right for this space. And this is, this isn't going to work out for us. And being very stern about that, we try to have a culture of safety, but also a, a, a culture of people coming in and, and doing weird, interesting things and using equipment, not quite the way it's supposed to be used. But as long as you're not using it in a dangerous manner, you know, take your time and pay attention to what you're doing. 
And we've actually had several members that we've had this conversation with. And, you know, every single time we've said, hey, this this is unacceptable. You, I understand that you've been doing this for a really long time, but you're, you're being a little reckless here. And if you're going to continue to work like this, you can't be here. And we get, you know, we get, you know, pushback, we get all this stuff, but when push comes to shove, if you're not safe in our shop, you're done. And people, people always come around, you know, we're, we, when we started being kind of hard about this, we were really worried like, oh, we're going to lose members and they're going to think we're being bossy. And it's like, no, I just want people not to get hurt. Yeah. And, you know, it's really, it's really worked out, you know, um, people are coming in and they're being safe and it's really nice that the community's kind of keeping itself in check because they're like, Hey, uh, you're using the table saw, you know, in a way that's not quite as safe as you should try it this way or else Devin's going to sit down and have a 20 minute conversation with you about cutting your fingers off. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and we've had, we've had a couple people we've had to let go from the space because they were being kind of reckless and never got to the, these people were kind of what I would put in the jackass category. They were doing things, trying to be funny but you don't horse around and around power tools because no, they don't joke. Um, you know, I was explaining how to use a drum sander, um, an open drum sander, not a thickness drum sander. And okay. uh, one of the members jammed a soda bottle into it, trying to be funny. And I was like, you're gone. And he's like, what? I was like, leave, give me your key. You're done. And he's like, well, it was a joke. I'm like, yeah, I understand. I'm not joking. You're gone. Give me your key right now. You know, and we just, we don't have a tolerance for it. You know, no. people want to come in and they want to try to be funny. You know, we had someone that someone was working on the lathe and someone came up and tried to flip the lathe on. You're done. Bye. We don't need you here. All right. Oh my gosh. You know, the lathe was unplugged, but still, it's not the point. The point is like, you don't like we have a rule one person on the machine at a time like if if i'm on a machine and you see me struggling you don't come in and help you ask if i need help all right because if yeah. you come in and i'm running a table saw and you think that i'm struggling and you go to grab a piece and pull it through the saw my fingers might go with it so we make sure that people understand like if someone's working on a project you get their attention you say hey do you need help you know, you don't, you don't rush in, you don't yell at them, you don't spook them, you don't set off fireworks. You know, you come in and you say, hey, do you need help? I will help you. Um, I will assist, but you're working the tool. You know, if you're on the table saw, I will catch your board. I'm not going to pull your board. All right. You're still going to do the work. I'm just going to assist you. Um, and yeah, like I said, we, we've only had a couple members we've had to tell, like, you're, this space is not right for you. Um, and it's, you know, it's been issues uh, with them at the at the moment, and we kind of worried about it. But other than a bad Google review, that's really all I've had to worry about. So if someone's not being safe, tell them and fix that situation, whether it's retraining them, whether it's making sure they understand you're serious or whether, t- at, you know, telling them to leave. You know, if you're not safe. It's not worth their whatever, you know, membership a month that's supporting your space if they're going to come in and be reckless and hurt themselves or other people. Yeah. And we've had, we've only had one member that I really had to get stern with like that. And he was defeating safety devices to get access to machines that he wasn't approved for. That didn't go over well. Yeah. We, we don't, we have zero tolerance for that. Yeah. I, I, not so politely told him to leave and it, he he did end up coming back and being a good member after that i don't really know i don't know what he was thinking at the time but well it's a hacker space man we gotta do hacker stuff right well that's he kind of said something along those lines and i was just and he, he's like you know i know how to work with this stuff he's a guy i worked with and i was like i don't care you can't unwire an e-stop so you can get around a key D stop. Like that's no, yeah, can't do that. Yeah, give me your keys. He left for a month. He came back. He got the point. Everyone else got the point. <laughs> it was very public when it happened. 
So it's about that time. You guys got any uh, final thoughts you want to share real quick? If you're in a makerspace and you're working on power tools and you have a question, if you have a doubt, stop. Um, if you're getting in the groove and you're listening to music and you're just like pumping out stuff across the tools, that is the time to walk away and get a drink of water or go take a coffee break or go pee or whatever. When, when you get in the groove where it just feels so easy, that's the time to walk away and just always keep your awareness up because that's when you get hurt. And I, I've, I don't know if you've been hurt by power tools, Devin, but I definitely have. And it's, it's always those times when you're either rushing to get a project done or you're like, you like hit a groove and everything's just like happening really fast and everything's really smooth. And then, then there's blood all over your work. Always be aware of what you're doing. They, d- yeah. they don't give second chances. Working in a machine shop environment for the last 15 years, that's definitely happened. I have quite a yeah. few scars across my arms and hands to you know attest to that. Um, I always like to remind people, I don't like cleaning up blood, and I do not like filling out police reports. You know? So, <laughs> yeah. Don't get yes. hurt at the shop. You know, but if you do get hurt, let me know. We'll get you taken care of. But you're right. You know, you get in the groove and you start zooming and you start thinking this. The second you think things are going well, that's right. Take a deep breath. Walk away. Go do something (laughs) else. Um, But when you come back, I always like to tell people, like, if someone's talking to you and you go back to your work, you take a deep breath and you do that. Where am I at? Where am I going? How do I get there? Every single time. All right. Yeah. If if uh, you hear the door buzzer and either someone's ringing the doorbell or someone walked through and we have a little door chime and you stop to see who it is and it's oh it's your buddy, whatever. And you go back to your work. Don't just flip the machine on and keep going. Just take a deep breath. Take a second. And it literally takes half a second once you get, you know, in the groove of saying, where am I at? Where am I going? And how do I get there? Evaluate your situation. Evaluate what you're going to do. Walk yourself through all the steps and then do the work. Um, and that that has saved me, you know, more times than not. And being in, in manufacturing in a fast-paced environment, I've seen lots of people get very seriously injured in my day job. So I don't want to see that happen at the space. I yes. don't want to see – I've seen hand files shoved through people's palms – I've seen people sever tendons and hands. I saw a dude get two vertebrae snap. Um, I've seen people dump equipment over. I saw a forklift fall over when someone was uh, driving too fast around a corner. And, you know, it's people getting complacent. Um, you know, all these people are fine to this day, but they, at the time they got very seriously injured, you know, and uh, I don't like mopping up blood. Yeah, and nothing puts a delay on your project like an emergency room visit. <laughs> exactly. You not know, a single it, thing. Yeah, you know, a night of sleep will not put a delay on your project like visiting the emergency room. Slower is faster. Yeah, we've we've talked about sleep as your superpower on the show before. Like, working on things tired is a bad idea. And one thing you brought up, Devin, that I wanted to bring up earlier and I completely forgot is somebody in your space preferably two people or more need to be trained on how to deal with blood because it is not Coke or beer or water. It has specific things that have to be done when there's blood on your equipment, when there's blood on your floor, you know, it needs to be handled in a certain way uh, or you risk, you know, not only the person that got hurt, you know, them being hurt, but you never know. And the people that, are cleaning up your situations, they need to not be at risk too. So you need somebody that is trained in how to deal with bloodborne pathogens and, you know, how know how to work with that. Uh, we're lucky enough that we have a trained EMT as part of our officer staff. Um, I have a past where I've been trained on how to deal with bloodborne pathogens. Like we have a couple people, but it's make sure somebody in your space is, comfortable with that and trained to deal with it exactly yeah we we just had somebody that hit their shin when we were moving uh about two or three weeks ago 
and they're a bleeder. And they're like, hey, can you help me bandage this up? And, you know, I put natural gloves on and I put a face mask on and I put safety glasses on. They're like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, I'm making sure that we're both safe here. You know, I know it's, you know, I know it's just a bump shin, but you have blood all the way down into your sock across the bottom of your foot. And I'm going to make sure you're okay. But well, like I said, they're a bleeder and I'm going to make sure I'm okay. You know, and I made sure like, okay, people, you know, stay out of the front room. I'll be working on this. We'll get this taken care of. And then afterwards, everything got sterilized. Um, And even like with my bloody gloves, I touched a box of Band-Aids. The Band-Aids got got destroyed. You know, it's like done. Band-Aids go in the trash. They're gone. Yep. They're gone forever. The guy who got hurt in our space was he wasn't super upset, but he was upset that a lot of his project was gone. And I was just like, there's blood on it. We can't risk it. It's gone. You know? Yeah. Take this trash bag home. Never bring it back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, thanks, Devin, for coming back. It's always a pleasure to have you. And you have such great knowledge to share. Well, you learn things when you mess stuff up. Yep. That's (laughs) typically when you learn. (laughs) Sorry for the somber episode, guys, but... It had to happen eventually, and, you know, the 50th episode felt right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around for us this long. You're probably not, we're probably not going to lose you after this one. So. That's right. Well, with that. Keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. Cast. 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 Cast.